Good afternoon. Hello. My God, they're brilliant. Right, who's awake? Hey, who's Mr. Train and had to come back in? Cool. Hopefully this will work. There we go, amazing. Um, just very, very quickly, um, so you know who or what I am. Uh, my background is uh, behavioral psychology. Um, I sort of get to grips with how and why people do things. Um, and for nearly 30 years now, my focus has been on how and why people buy things. And for the last 10, 15 years, I've been working with brands and agencies and people who have an, an, a need to understand how they align their marketing with sort of how and why people buy. Um, I have an agency underneath that. I have a coaching business that runs alongside it. Um, I'm not a creative individual. Uh, I'm a commercial individual. So everything I talk about is about results. It's about outcomes, not outputs. Uh, even, even my creatives in my business are not allowed to be called creatives. They're called commercial engineers, which in itself is a paradox because that's quite a creative title. Um, but our, our work has been driven to the forefront over the last probably five or six years, uh, particularly the advent of uh, social media, which is the one thing that has caused chaos uh, in, in our world, because we're no longer in control. It's disjointed, it's crowded, it's loud, it's messy. Um, and the consumer knows more about us now than we do about, the, about them. And in terms of us analyzing data and, and, and using that to, to rank people and tag people and segment people, all of that's useful. But they are totally in control of the, of, of the operation of purchasing, which has changed dramatically. So the, so the media has changed, uh, but people haven't. Um, I've worked with newspapers and helped them build digital subscriptions because people do not buy newspapers anymore. And that means nobody wants to pay for advertising in newspapers anymore. So the whole focus on what we do is getting, getting brands and individuals and businesses and agencies to, to get to grips with how they can align how things work. And I'm going to go through three things today. Um, and in short, the three things that we focus on when we work with people. The first one is understanding why anybody does anything at all. The second one is how to align my marketing, my activity, my strategy, my creativity around how people do anything. And then thirdly, I'm going to give you a couple of snippets of the strategies and processes that we put into place for businesses to help them drive and grow commercially. Um, the, the, big, the biggest issue that we have when we talk to people, particularly those that are very, very proud of their business as a whole, um, is that we sort of say to them, people only care about themselves. They don't care about the products or services that I or you or other businesses offer. It doesn't matter. It's ultimately about how it makes them feel. Nobody goes to a gym because they want to go to a gym. People join a gym because they want to feel healthy and they want to look better and they want people to comment on how better they now look. Um, and I'm not allowed on my slides, my team tell me off, I go, people don't care at all about your products or services. I have to change that to say there is a limited interest. Because it's the outcome, my, my, my whole mindset, the whole commerciality of what I talk about is about outcomes. And if we buy something, it's about an outcome. Marketing is simple. It's getting somebody from here to here. I'm fat, I want to be thin. I'm unhappy, I want to be happy. I'm feeling ill, I want to feel well. I've got a, a worse car than my neighbor, I want a better one. Does that make sense? So what we do is we facilitate the transition. The product facilitates the transition. And we get caught in facilities and benefits and features and tech, and none of it matters unless it sells. And I'm allowed to keep this slide in. To me, price is irrelevant. It's very difficult when you chat to somebody about a five pound pizza package and everything else, but price is irrelevant at the end of the day. What's important is two things. First one's affordability. If you can't afford it, you can't have it, unless you steal it or borrow it 
or potentially lease it or contract hire it. And the other thing is value. And value is subjective. And one of the biggest things about data, when we analyze data and we look at the segmentation of how people buy, the truth is it's logical. And we don't react and respond logically. We think we do, but we don't. So value is something that's important to each and every single individual. And marketing can't portray that. It doesn't matter how much you segment people down, it can't, it can't portray that. So the only thing you can do is focus on who and work backwards from there. Because what you do, is, as I said, is not as important as the person, the who, that you are selling to. And I think at the end of the day, when you buy anything at all, and when you have any, whether it's e-commerce, whether it's in store, whether it's an event, whether it's a product, whether it's a service, it all boils down to wants and needs. That's it. The whole concept of um, no pain, no gain, that phrase, which is a, a sort of health club phrase. We live and die based on pain and pleasure. They're the only two uh, parameters in life that are important to us. We want to be happy, we want to be safe. We don't want to hurt, we want to feel great. So every decision that anybody ever makes, when they buy something, when they interact with a brand, when they engage with a brand, is moving to one of those paradigms. That's what we all tend to try and achieve. And we convince ourselves that we want something and we need something. We don't need a lot anymore. We only really need one pair of, sh pair of, pair of shoes to get by. Most of us have at least 10. My wife has 4,612, which is three less than the amount of handbags she's actually purchased. Um, but it's based on actually what we feel. Because if we think we want something, or we think we need something, guess what? That's as important as actually wanting or needing it. But the whole process of purchase is driven emotionally. Not logically, emotionally. Now, we will justify with logic, because that's what we do. Because we can't really be that honest about, well, I've just bought a pair of jeans for £5,000 because there were better denim than other jeans. That's the logic behind it. But the truth is, I'm, I'm more likely to uh, get lucky on a night out if I feel more confident in my... See, you know what I mean? You're nodding away. Absolutely. Should have sat at the back with everybody else. Um, so it's driven by emotion. And we get caught up in our products and services, and we, yet we don't focus on the emotion that drives that intrinsic sale. Not external, but intrinsic. Has anybody ever got married? A few. Anybody got married more than once? Why do you spend the most money on a dress that, that you'll ever spend when you know you're only going to wear it once? Unless you're my auntie who gets really good value out of her wedding dress. That's not logical, that's emotional. Because it's the most important day of that person's life at that point. So it's worth every penny. Does that make sense? And you can take some basic concepts of, if you take the concept of time, who, who, who's got a watch? That's, it's a bit of a daft question, but who's got a watch? So who spent more than, let's say, £200 on a watch? Okay. From a timekeeping perspective, that an £8 Seiko will be probably as close as it gets to timekeeping. But we don't buy watches to tell the time. We buy watches because of what it says about us. Rolex gets it. Rolex doesn't sell watches. Rolex sells luxury. And the irony when you come to it, people go, well, I need a watch, I do need to tell the time. Apparently, nine out of ten of us use our phone to tell the time. So we don't actually need watches. But watches aren't there to tell the time. Watches that are sold to tell the time, this might sound odd, is only 12% of the market. Those are the small, cheap, digital watches that are available for somewhere between 5 and 25 pounds. The other 88% of the market, 3.7 billion pounds worth of our money, is on watches that aren't bought to tell the time. The watches that are bought that say, I'm wealthy. 
the watches that are bought to go, I potentially could be a pilot. I potentially could be a deep sea diver. This watch goes to 3,000 feet, which is a facility I obviously use regularly. So it's all about the emotion behind it, not about the product itself. And I talked about shoes and I joked about my wife. But the irony is we only have one pair of feet, so why do we need more than one pair of shoes? Our limbic brain makes sure that we collect things that are colourful, hence shoes. From a female perspective, from a male perspective, we're less interested in collecting things. We'd rather go out to the plains and batter a saber-toothed target to death and bring it back. That's still sort of within us. And people go, oh, well, this is the modern day. It's the modern day. That caveman stuff doesn't work. It makes sense. But it's part of our limbic brain. It's part of the way that we are. Our prefrontal cortex is quite new. And to give you an example of how new we are in this world in terms of and, and, and everything squeezed into our lifetime and we think this is new. I read somewhere the other day stegosauruses were wiped out by a comet 150 million years ago and a, a T-Rex walked the earth 60 million years ago. So the T-Rex is closer to the iPad than it is to a stegosaurus which baffled me for a while. I, was, I sat there trying to work that out. But that's, the, but that's the truth behind it. So everything that we do, we have a very logical brain that sits at the front, but it's a very new brain. Everything we do is driven by our little monkey chimp brain, our limbic brain, our reptilian brain, whatever phrase you want to give it. And it accounts for things like arguments and love and fighting and road rage and all that sort of stuff. And that love-hate relationship with Facebook and why your friends all have a better life than you do based on that. So I talked about value, so very quickly, how do you create value within marketing for clients or within your own businesses? And it's fairly straightforward. You decide who you stand for, and you decide what you stand for. And at the same time, you look at then start trying to create the gap, as I mentioned, between A and B. Because who and what you stand for is what your brand of business is about, because you go through life with everything you buy and everything you engage with and everybody you want to be with. So it adds to the story of you and who you are. Does that make sense? And brands understand that and they go out of their way to let people know who you are. For those that own a car, there's a badge on the front. Who's that badge for? It's not for you. It's for the driver in front. That's what the badge is for because you can't see it. Yours is on your steering wheel in case you forget what you're in. I like to remind you every day how lucky you are. Does that make sense? The badge on the front is for the person in front of you. And in life, we want the person in front of us to know about us. Apple are geniuses at what they do. They're an amazing marketing business. Not very creative. People don't like me saying that. They've never created a product in their life. They've copied every great product going and made it better. But they're phenomenally good at the badge on the bonnet concept. Has anybody got, has anybody got um, an old I, iBook on iMac? Remember the, remember the Apple logo used to light up when you lifted the lid up? Yeah, that was just a, a single finger to the people at the other side of the airport that aren't quite as cool and as clever as you. That's the only reason it's there. Again, you can't see it, but it's not for you. It's still there to this day, but it's dulled out. So understanding that when we purchase something, we do it emotionally. When our customers purchase something, they're doing it emotionally. You can argue as much as you want that we're logical. We'll throw logic into the mix. The higher the decision, not the higher the price, but the higher the decision on the purchase, a bit more logic kicks in. But house prices and, and house purchases, which are relatively big in terms of decisions, we go with our emotion. We'll go with our emotion. We'll take a bedroom less if it's close to the right schools. We're more concerned what the front of the house looks like than we are the back. It's a badge on the, budget, the badge on the bonnet concept. So when you build any marketing strategy or any marketing creative, no matter how much data you've got, no matter how much artificial intelligence and, and everything else we're building into the campaigns nowadays, all at the end of the day, it's about who you sell to 
and how you make them feel. And if you start at that point, you are probably so much further down the track than anybody else that you're working with. One of the questions that was desperate for me to ask when um, Beverly was talking from Pisa earlier is why have you copied Dollar Shave Club? And nobody, was, nobody had that. I, I couldn't do it. So I'm not, I couldn't get why. But it's not about copying. It's about understanding that they're moving from function to emotion and understanding that that brand and that type of humour at the moment is emotionally engaging. And that's the reason why the campaign started to work for them. How they then split that down across social media and everything else is the strategy. But the very beginning about who and why is what allowed that to be successful. I said talk about three things. The second one is understanding how the brain actually works and how you can align your marketing or your funnels or your, or your uh, tactics around that. And Let's take you through this. There's something called the change continuum, and it's what we go through with everything we do. Any decision you make pushes you through this. You start with an indifference, and we all live in indifference. Indifference is the technical term, the scientific term, is I don't give a crap. And indifference is a place where we are and where we go to survive. The brain goes, you're not interested in that, I'm not going to tell you about it. I'm not going to inform the body about it. And so we go through life indifferent to most things, unless we become aware. And aware means we have an interest, there's an issue, there's a problem, there's something that needs solving, there's pain, or there's a potential for pleasure. And the minute we go into awareness, we never go back. We can never go back. You have something at the bottom of your limbic brain, the top of your uh, spine, which is called the RAS which is a reticular activating system. But what it does is immense. It blocks out everything that you feel is irrelevant. It blocks out everything that is indifferent to you and in your life. But it starts banging the drum loudly when you become aware there's an issue or there's a problem. So if you've ever bought a, if I go back to cars, if you've ever bought a car and you decide that, right, I'm gonna buy a Volkswagen Beetle when you decide to buy a Volkswagen Beetle, they seem to pop up pretty much regularly on a daily basis. Yet they never seem to before. And when you actually buy one, they seem to be absolutely everywhere. When you're looking to move house, all of a sudden, there are for sale signs everywhere. Everything has always been everywhere. But when you live in indifference, the, the brain blocks it out. And that's a big, a big issue for marketeers because no matter what ads you place, if people are in indifference, they don't see them. When we flew here today or drove here today or trained it here today, I'm not sure if trained it is a phrase, but you will have passed allegedly thousands of adverts. You probably can't remember more than a handful, but the handful you do remember are based around the fact that you're aware there's an issue or a problem that will help you out. You go from awareness you actually go into consideration, but I'm going to leave that for today. And you go into preference. And preference is, this is what I would rather do. And from preference, you go into intention. And from intention, you go into action. Or in our world, you go into purchase. That's how we do anything. When you get up in the morning and decide to brush your teeth, you go very quickly through that. When you decide, which takes a little bit longer usually, to get married or get divorced, you go through that. When you buy anything, you go through that. So if that is how people buy, then surely isn't that how we should market to people? Isn't that how we sell people? So the key is to align your model, your strategy, your funnels, your e-commerce uh, tactics, your offline store traffic initiatives around this model. And we used to get away with that. 15, 20 years ago, I could get away with that. I can place that in a newspaper. I can do a radio jingle. If I've got a bit more money from a client, I can do a TV ad. And what that will do is drive the people that are that far down the funnel to come and purchase. I'll titillate it a little bit with an offer. I'll give you 10% off. And if you look at our industry as a whole, 
you go back to the, the 50s and 60s, that, that's how the whole concept was, was driven. The big soap companies created TV programs and placed their ads around them, sold their products, reinvested the money. It doesn't work anymore. And the reason it doesn't work anymore because now the consumer does this. I talked about gyms. I use that as an example. But what used to happen, you used to, you used to sit there watching Jeremy Carvey runs at 2 o'clock in the morning feeling sorry for yourself, so you'd have a donut because that's good for you. Not long term, but short term, it's great because the endorphins kick in and you are happy. Covered in jam and sugar, but you are happy. So you went to bed until the next night. Whereas now, they don't, they don't do that. I, I presume jam donut sales must be down dramatically. But because of iPads and Google and Facebook and 4G and Alexa and everything else that we drive into the market, they now start to search. They now start to Google. They now start to chat on Facebook. They now start to, depend on your age, WhatsApp and have discussions. So all of a sudden, they're ahead of the game. And the problem is when they're ahead of the game, when they are basically at the awareness stage and the consideration stage, they have a problem that needs resolving. They may not even know what the product or service is that can best deliver on that. And that's the problem that they live in. So what do we do? Well, can we align our strategy around it? If at that very awareness st that stage, they're not interested in the product or service, they want a solution. If we take the health clubs, they probably become aware that they're overweight, aware they're unhealthy. Not that they need to join a gym or have gastric band surgery or buy a dog and take it for a walk. All those are things they could probably do to lose weight. So if your message is, for these people, is about solving emotional issues, your messages and your content is around moving them towards a decision-making process. Because this is a funnel, and as you all know, you'll have a funnel up here, which is where you start, and eventually work down to here to where people buy. And if we focus down here, we're going to lose these people, because they will self-educate, self-nurture, and self-purchase. And if we take our messages from down here and put them up there, they won't resonate, because there's no emotion, there's no engagement, there's no value. It doesn't matter if you can make it affordable, there is no value. So with all the people that we work with, they say, well, how can you generate a conversation? And I don't mean get someone to read some organic post or somebody to, to look at some content. How can you get them to give you a name, an email address, a phone number, the mother's maiden name? How can you get that to work to sell them stuff down the line? And this is why Apple are one of the biggest businesses in the world and why Amazon are phenomenal at what they do. Because they start delivering on this very early, early on. If you think about what they generate in terms of data, in terms of information, before you really get into purchasing, you can download iTunes or before it's been taken away now. We could download iTunes for free in exchange for your credit card, your thumbprint, your facial recognition system. They understood that that is where the relationship starts. And once you've then looked at generate that, that all of a sudden you start to re-own the relationship again. And this is where segmentation becomes important. This is where data starts to play a key, but not before. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you're in charge of the conversion. You can decide what you offer people, when you offer it them, and how you offer it them. And you can do it in, in, in mass emails, you can do it in, in, in mass offers, or we can do it in segmented offers. But either way, the difference is profound. And the biggest issue with this, it's like compound selling. My math is not my strong point, so I should do my best. But if you get 1,000 people to your website and you get 100 leads, it's different, than, and from that you get three sales. Well, the old way, you get 1,000 people to your website and three sales. But for the first couple of days, you're no better off. But going forward, you now have 97 leads that you've not yet converted, you can work on the next day, the next day. It's like compound interest. It is all in the back end. That's where profit exists. Not in the initial sale, but the initial contact, the initial lead.
And once you have that in place, it's simply then all about the percentages. It's all about understanding that people go through this process. They may bounce up and down that process for a long, long time. Just because you wake up one day and decide you need to lose weight, or buy a car, move house, or get divorced, doesn't mean you do it within a few days. Yet we sell as if they're making a decision within a few days. We spend a lot of time looking at people's websites, and it's bonkers. People seem to think a website, and, and the name is misleading. It's not a site. It's just a dumping area for a load of different pages. But ultimately, people are going there to find out information. But what you want to do when they get to that website is to ask yourself one question and deliver on it across every single page. What is the one thing I want people to do when they visit this website? E-commerce is different. We possibly want them to buy. If you're smart on e-commerce, we want them to engage with us before they buy. And it might be a simple um, uh, exit page strategy or, or in-page retargeting strategy to generate a 20% voucher if you sign up now. But it's that first stage that drives the rest of it. And we need to take the same approach with all areas of our business in terms of how we engage with people. Can we get and swap something to them for nothing in exchange for information that allows us to sell them down the line? Because that's how they buy. They don't buy straight away. And ever since Google popped up and Facebook popped up, they now get all their information before they come to you. I'm buying a car for my wife at the moment. I know exactly how much the car is. I know exactly what I want from the car. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, I'd have to go to the dealership to get it. So what can they do? What can they offer? Work that we do from a, a number of high-end luxury marks is we create VIP waiting lists. So you may get a £120,000 pre-loved car. I'm not allowed to say pre-owned. Pre-loved car coming in, and it's on the forecourt for Saturday. But you register and you engage with me, you become part of my VIP list, I'll give you access to that on Wednesday. And wealthy people like what they can't have. So just very quickly, let me run through some performance enhancers. We have about 20, 25 things that we drop in for people. Um, and I've picked the biggest and easiest ones. All of them are based around the 100, I can't even read that number, is that two minutes left? Brilliant. 137 triggers and biases, which we all follow and we all do. We're all scared of life. We're all desperate to be loved. We're all desperate to be better. We all love to procrastinate and do nothing if we can. We all love a sense of security. We all love consistency. And we all love social proofing, which Facebook obviously has built a massive business on. And the beauty of social proofing, we also like being together, but we also like a bit of a fight, which is how Facebook has built a business on it. Whatever your views are around politics, Facebook are very good at uh, showing you something that you're very proactive about and giving you 60, 70 proactive comments. You go, yes, yes, I agree. I agree with that. And then they just toss in a bit of meat. Somebody that completely disagrees with the whole group and they devour. The whole group devour the individual. Which I'm back to caves again, but that's how we operate and how we work. And they know that. Because if you keep reading everybody agreeing to the same thing over and over again, I'm going to get bored. Give me a bit of a fight. Because I like a bit of a fight. I like to f feel part of a tribe. I like to feel secure. And I like to take down anyone that doesn't agree with my views. So from that, we've created a number of triggers for people. And ultimately, we talk about uh, the, a freemium cross-social. Freemium social selling, we talk about it. That unless you already have a database of people that you've sold to, which your customer audience up and sell to, fine. But otherwise, don't sell. Provide something for free. Because nobody, again, apart from my auntie, gets married on a first date. So why are we trying to sell them the first time they've been anywhere near our brand or product? And the whole aspect of uh, compound selling, uh, compound interest kicks in again. You'll still sell to the people you would have sold to, but now you're building a much bigger group of people that you can talk to. And very quickly, we spend a lot of time looking at what we, what we class as the ultimate in business success, which is getting people to pay you every month without fail the same amount of money, regardless of how they interact and purchase from you. And, if, and, and gyms do it. 
And he came to me, and we run the, I run my own business like this. I went with anybody unless they pay the same amount of money every single month, as long as I deliver for them. And that comes from my background. I built a health club chain, which I sold uh, in the late 90s. And one day, I was on a treadmill early in the morning, and the place was heaving. And it was the first of the month. And it's always gone the first of the month because all the money comes in on the direct debit. And it just hit me that these people are paying me and using it. But it's another 11,900 people who aren't. They're paying me, but they're not using it today. And, and that whole concept of creating a membership, a tribe, a subscription, to me is the holy grail of any business commercial uh, entity that's out there in, in this world today. Um, there's a gentleman afterwards from, from Amazon. And if you look at Amazon Prime, I, I mean, I, I don't know if he would share the numbers later, but it's millions of people, millions of people who are members. Probably the biggest membership club in the world and growing at, at all times. And if you think, well, it's not for me, I'm not part of the membership economy. Well, if you use Netflix, you are. If you use Spotify, you are. And technically, if you're part of Amazon Prime, you are. And just finally, and this is more of a commercial thing than anybody else, whether you're with, you, with your clients, with your own businesses, we're not all the same. I hope I've got that across. We're not all the same. But we can be grouped together. The bulk of your customers or your clients' customers will pay the basic going rate for something. There is a percentage that will pay 20 30% more, and there's a very small percentage, probably 1% to 5% of people, who will pay you whatever you like. And it works across every business. If you take, again, some of the high-end luxury mark car dealerships uh, and brands, that, their entry level is 167,000. But by the time you finish with the 1%, that 167,000 pound car now costs 352,000, particularly if you take the 11,000 pound clock that you need for the dash. Does that make sense? We call it product stacking and premium pricing. And it's across every industry, and if it's not in your business or not in your client's businesses, it needs to go in. And for those that are lucky enough to stay in the top here, in the luxury suites, or whether you're in the cheap seats, it runs all the way through every single business. Even Beyonce is doing it. Bless her. You can pay $67 to go and watch Beyonce in concert. You can pay $230 to get in the first three rows. You can spend $690, I don't know why it's $690, but it is, to go backstage. You can have a one-to-one -one for $1,900. Every business can do it. Every business should. And just to finish off, I know I've gone one minute over. I do apologize. Because what I'm talking about, all the real money is in the back end. The earlier you can engage with people, the more you will sell. The more you look to generate a relationship without them paying anything to start with, the more you will sell. The more you control the relationship and build in memberships and premium pricing, the more you will sell. And the irony is with all of this, the reason you sell more is because they're happier. They're happy with the level of contact, they're happy with the engagement, they're happy with the different levels of things they can buy into. So we're done. So thank you very much. Just very, very quickly, we have a quarterly magazine. If you'd like a copy sent to you, just text that number, which is mine. Please no pictures. My wife gets upset, particularly when they're from boys. And we're just about to send out our second edition of our uh, little book of persuasion. If you'd like a copy of that for free, by the way, I'm building a list. I'm generating leads. Feel free to do that. I thought I'd be honest about it while we're here. Sorry I've got over. Thank you very much indeed. I hope someone that was useful. I appreciate your time.